the amendment. Senator Simons. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Merci, Mr. President. I rise today to speak in support of this amendment by my colleague, Senator Patterson. I had actually intended to offer a similar amendment of my own, but I am pleased instead to rise today to concur with my colleague across the floor. When I first joined the Standing Senate Committee on Transport and Communications some seven months ago, I'm not going to lie, I volunteered for the committee primarily because of my long career in journalism and my interest in communications policy in the digital age. I had no idea that I would, along the way, be put in the unenviable position of holding the deciding vote in committee on Bill C-48. My decision to vote against the bill in committee was an extremely difficult one. In April, I had the remarkable privilege of traveling to Prince Rupert in Terrace, British Columbia, for public hearings on the tanker ban. It was an extraordinary opportunity. We heard from passionate witnesses, from First Nations leaders, from environmental scientists, from fisheries workers, from local mayors, from grassroots community activists, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who spoke powerfully in support of the bill, who spoke with moving, poetic eloquence about the need to protect not just the waters of the northern BC coast, but the vital salmon spawning areas of the stunning Skeena River. I heard the emotion, the fear, and the frustration in their voices, and I was deeply moved by their love for their lands and their waters and I saw firsthand just how beautiful and unique those landscapes and seascapes are. So make no mistake, I do not stand here tonight as an industry shill, nor as someone who's cowering in fear of Twitter trolls. I haven't been harassed and I haven't been bullied into taking this position. I heard the voices of those passionate British Columbians who have fought long and hard for this tanker ban, and I understood their reasons. And indeed, I don't just honor their words, I share their concerns. This is an area that does indeed cry out for strict environmental safeguards and for a far better regional response system to deal with any possible pollution than exists now. But I also stand here today as a proud Albertan, et je suis fier d'être Albertaine vraiment. And I stand here as a worried Canadian. And I say to you that Bill C-48, as written, isn't just bad for Alberta and its oil industry, it is bad for our Confederation. Alberta is a landlocked province. The only way we can get our goods to Asian or European markets, our canola, our wheat, our lentils, our beef, and yes, our oil, is by cooperating with our partner provinces in Confederation and with our federal government. And we entered Confederation in 1905 on that promise of being part of a larger United Nation, a country where provinces help and support one another. So please, just as I tried to understand in British Columbia, Try to understand the emotion, the fear, and the frustration of Albertans who feel as though they are being told at every turn that they are not allowed to transport their most important export to new overseas markets, and who feel that they are being told that they are not equal partners in our federal system. It is absolutely right and appropriate that we take active measures to protect Canada's northwest coast from environmental degradation. But slamming the door in Alberta's face imposing a permanent ban on allowing tankers to pick up oil from northern ports, especially while TMX is still under review, that is a violation of the fundamental contract of Confederation itself. And I fear it is giving aid and comfort to Alberta's long dormant separatist movement, a once fringe element which has risen from the ashes in a particularly troubling and virulent form, a movement born out of frustration and rage, which is being stoked and exploited and manipulated by others for political ends. And as an Albertan and a passionately proud Canadian, I am deeply worried about legislation that plays into that separatist narrative. And so, ever since we first started hearing witnesses on C-48, I have been striving to find a practical, sensible Canadian compromise, a way forward that does not cut off all hope for Albertans, but which at the same time protects the integrity of the Pacific Northwest ecosystem and respects the rights and wishes of the coastal First Nations. The most obvious path forward at first seemed to be a designated shipping lane, an ocean corridor that would allow tankers a straight shot from a specific port out to open sea so that oil could move safely to market without having tankers transit down the treacherous Queen Charlotte Sound or the Hecate Strait. But we are not maritime cartographers, my friend. It's, it doesn't seem logical for me, for us as senators, to take on the task of designating a specific marine corridor. We simply don't have the expertise or the authority. And that's when I realized it's not our job to be shipping lane surveyors. It's our jobs as senators to fight to uphold the Constitution, to fight not just for my region, but for the good of the nation. And so I returned to the first-hand evidence we were privileged to hear when we were in Prince Rupert and Terrace. 
I return to the powerful words of the Niska First Nation. The Niska Territory lies north of Prince Rupert and north of Haida Gwaii. Indeed, it borders right up against the archipelago of southern Alaska. And that's important to the argument made by Senator Patterson earlier, because it means that if oil ever were to be exported by a future new port on Niska land and then out to international waters straight through the Portland Canal, it would minimize the risk of contamination to the coastline further south. When C-48 was conceived and presented as a symbol of reconciliation, it does not, I suggest, respect the treaty rights of the Niska Nation, which is a signatory to a modern treaty with Canada, as Senator Patterson said, the first of its kind in Canada. And the Niska, as he eloquently argued, believed they were not properly consulted as per Section 35 of the Constitution. They insist that C-48 abrogates their rights to economic self-determination and their rights to assess and develop infrastructure projects on their own treaty territory. While we were in BC, we heard from other First Nations who are divided on the bill, such as the Laxqualam and the tribes who are ambivalent, such as the Meta I can't say this, the Met Metlakatla, who favor a short-term moratorium but not a permanent ban. In contrast, the Niska have consistently presented a united argument in opposition to the bill. Both Senators Labakan Benson and Patterson have quoted from President Eva Clayton's letter. But I also want her to cite her testimony before our committee heard at the Terrace Best Western in April. Now, I should be clear, President Clayton did not tell us that her nation wanted to see a pipeline run through its territory. She did not say that the Niska welcome oil supertankers in their coastal waters. Instead, she made a simple, compelling argument that the Niska want a say in what happens on their territory just as they want the right to engage in their own environmental evaluation of any specific future proposal. May I quote from President Clayton's testimony? Allowing the provisions of our treaty to assess any potential project on its merits would ensure that scientific evidence plays an essential role in assessing impacts and informing decision-making instead of the current approach which unilaterally and arbitrarily enacts a bank blanket tanker ban over a particular region of Canada, she told us. And if we grant to treaty nations some rights to self-government, we can't ignore those rights simply when it's no longer convenient or doesn't suit our political narrative du jour. Is it in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation for the government of Canada to say, in a somewhat patronizing and paternalistic way, that it's imposing a ban on this particular form of economic development on all First Nations along the coast? And that it's imposing this ban whether those nations want it or not for their own good? The Niska Treaty may not be convenient to the government in this instance, but it is a treaty written in black and white. And so I ask you, is there a way to honor the spirit and the letter of the Niska Treaty while still protecting the coast, and at the same time to send a clear message back home to Albertans that they are respected members of the Canadian family? Certainly, the amendment made by Senator Sinclair last night and spoken to so eloquently by Senators Pratt, McCallum, Labakan, Benson, and Wu gets us part of the way there, and I was proud to stand tonight and vote for their amendment. But I don't believe it goes quite far enough, and I believe Senator Patterson's elegant amendment helps us to get the rest of the way there. Right now, the Niska Nation doesn't have a working deep water port on its lands but it has the potential to develop one in the watershed of the Nass River, in the treaty, ter treaty territory known as the Nass Area. And if you'll allow me to cite from the Niska Final Agreement, the Nass Area means the entire Nass watershed, all Canadian watersheds and water bodies that drain into portions of the Portland Inlet, Observatory Inlet, or Portland Canal, as defined in subparagraph C, and C, all marine waters in Pierce Canal, Portland Inlet, Observatory Inlet, and Portland Canal, northeast of a line commencing at the Canadian border, midway between Pierce Island and Wales Island, and proceeding along Wales Passage southeasterly to Portland Inlet, then northeasterly to the midpoint between Start Point and Trefusis Point, then south to Gadju Point. The Niska Nation owns and has control over the development on Niska lands. The nation also has comprehensive rights relating to consultation and environmental assessment over proposed developments in that NAS area. Those treaty rights are set out in Chapter 10 of the Niska Final Agreement, the Environmental Protection and Assessment Chapter. And those rights are triggered any time a potential project may reasonably, reasonably be expected to have adverse environmental effects on residents of Niska lands or Niska treaty interests. Therefore, be clear that Senator Patterson's amendment in no way means that environmental considerations would be ignored or overlooked, especially not when Bill C-69, as amended, comes into force. 
Rather, it would give this nation a chance to manage its own lands, its own waterways, its own economic future. We would be respecting the legal and moral rights of treaty title holders, while at the same time leaving open the possibility of future development and extending hope to the people of my province. We could honor the constitutional rights of the NISCA while simultaneously defending the fabric of Confederation. And if we stand together in this chamber tonight, we could send the House of Commons a strong message that we are looking at this bill in a thoughtful, nonpartisan way, not as conservatives, liberals, or independents, but as Canadian senators dedicated to serving the best interests of all Canadians. Thank you. Merci. I'm sorry, uh, Senator Simons, but your time has expired. Are you asking for five minutes to answer questions? I, I'm very much uh, asking for a little more time. Is leave granted, honorable senators? Agreed? Uh, order, please. Is leave granted? Yes. Senator Simons. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for the, for the question. I, I feel like there's a second question embedded in there which deals with the, with the issue of, of the Supreme Court decision. And I think that actually speaks to precisely why Senator Patterson's amendment is needed. Because I think it's absolutely true that, that juris, uh, jurisprudence suggests that First Nations don't have the right to regulate the waters off their shores. Senator Patterson's amendment wouldn't give them that right. It would simply exempt, as you, if you like, that particular area from the full force and effect of C-48. And that, I guess, is one of the, the weaknesses that there might be in the amendment we passed earlier today, because the non-derogation clause, as you correctly point out, may not do the job because of precisely the reasons that you cited in that judgment. And that, I would, I would suggest, is all the more reason to, to support Senator Patterson's amendment. It is the complementary part that goes with the amendment spoken to so eloquently by Senator Sinclair and, and Senator Pratt and, and, and Senator McCallum and, and Labakan Benson and uh, Wu last night. I, I think if we put these two pieces together, we would have the answer. But as to your other question, I don't think the oil industry has any right to dictate to the government the nature of its maritime pollution policy. What I'm asking is a subtler question, which is what is the price of confederation that we are willing to pay by refusing to compromise? And I come back to the most eloquent words of Senator Wu last night when he said, I don't, you know, we, we shouldn't be asked to choose between one extreme and the other. I think Senator Wu was absolutely correct when he said that the rhetoric on both sides imagines consequences that are far exaggerated from, from what they are. So I, I'm going to come back to what Senator Wu said last night, we need to find a compromise. And much as I supported full-throatedly uh, the amendment we voted on earlier today, I ask that the rest of you, whatever your party affiliation, really seriously consider Senator Patterson's amendment, which I believe honors both the, 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 the spirit of the Treaty of Veniska and also speaks to a swell of very disturbing alienation in Alberta, which, having lived through the National Energy Program, I, I thought I'd seen this before, but in the last 24 hours, there, there is, a, there is a, a rough beast shuffling towards Bethlehem, and, and I don't want to see it born. Senator, Senator I, I'm afraid I don't. I didn't realize there were oil industries or refineries in Niskaland. 